Good morning, everyone. It's brilliant to be here. This panel is Free Speech in the Shadow of Religious Fundamentalism. Um, We're so grateful to Philia for this amazing opportunity here to speak to you. Feminist Dissent is a free online journal exploring links between sex and gender and resurgent religious fundamentalism and nationalism. Feminist Dissent 6, which is out very soon, is a special issue on free speech. Uh, And I will quote from the introduction. Debates about free speech are not new. However, the form they take now seems particularly vindictive and violent. Across the world, we are witness to disturbing moves to curtail free speech in liberal democracies and totalitarian states alike, and among left-wing as well as right-wing movements. As recent events show, free speech is a first casualty of all forms of authoritarianism, including religious fundamentalism. And from this flow, a range of other crackdowns on civil society and serious human rights violations that cannot be challenged. This is why the debate on freedom of speech has become increasingly urgent. Looking at the Philia agenda, the issue of free speech actually cuts across so many panels. The suppression and policing of free speech has specific impact on women. Wherever fundamentalists have influence, whether in a theocratic state such as Iran, or within a minority community subject to religious law in the UK, women's free expression and room for maneuver is reduced. That is why for us, free speech is not an abstract principle in the marketplace of ideas, but a material need. We've invited amazing speakers who can tell us about particular threats to free speech from authoritarian fundamentalist movements. Feminist dissent defines a fundamentalist movement as a modern political movement of the far right that uses religion to gain or consolidate power. Fundamentalism is found in all major religions, sometimes holding state power, sometimes in opposition to it, and sometimes working within the confines of a secular state to control minority communities. Fundamentalist movements look back to an imagined past of unchallenged patriarchal power, but are in fact modern movements using contemporary political spaces and the most modern technologies. They gain power by attacking more universalist and pluralist traditions that exist within religions. Control of children, women, and sexual minorities is central along with a rigid policing of gender roles. Authority over women's minds and bodies is at the heart of the fundamentalist project in all religions. Women are controlled through presenting them as the upholders of the morals and traditions of the whole community. Those who resist this role can be cast out and are often subject to violence. For us in feminist descent, Secularism does not mean atheism, although the acceptance of the right not to believe and the right to leave religion is essential and must be continuously fought for. For us, secularism means that God's law should not be the law of the land and religious pressure groups should not be able to impose their will on society. In addition, our movements should create and defend spaces where religious identity is not seen as the only or most important aspect of anyone. Fundamentalist movements have successfully used both electoral politics and coups to seize power in secular states. For example, Hindutva in India, Muslim Brotherhood in Turkey, the religious right in Israel, and the attempted 6th of January coup and takeover of the Supreme Court in the United States. These are political movements of the extreme right. So despite differences between the countries our speakers will discuss, there are some shared themes. I will invite our speakers to um, address a question and however they see fit. I'll read the question, then introduce our first speaker. Um, How have you 
encountered issues of free speech and censorship in relation to religious fundamentalists and authoritarian politics? And can you comment on the implications for the struggle for women's rights for a secular and democratic society? Pragna was a founding member of South All Black Sisters, founded in 1979, from which she recently retired as director. A secularist campaigner, Pragna also co-founded Women Against Fundamentalism, and she's on the editorial collective of Feminist Dissent. I have to be honest and, and say that in, the, in this country, I hadn't really made the connection between free speech, religious fundamentalism, and women's rights until the Rushdie affair in 1989, when as part of South Hill Black Sisters, we found ourselves having to connect these issues whilst mounting a defense of Salman Rushdie. Many of you will know that on 12th August this year, Rushdie was viciously stabbed by a 24-year-old man in New York in what appears to be a fundamentalist-inspired attack. The good news is that Rushdie has survived and hopefully is on the road to full recovery. The bad news is that he was stabbed for presumably writing a novel, The Satanic Verses, which was published in 1989 to great critical acclaim, but also to great Islamist fury who deemed it to be blasphemous. The then Iranian religious leader, Ayatollah Khomeini, issued a fatwa calling for Rushdie's death, which forced him to go into hiding. And subsequently, country after country banned the book, and other translators of his novel uh, were assaulted, and one was actually killed. Um, Rushdie's attacker, had not even been born when the Satanic Verses was written. He has admitted to not having read the novel, but this did not stop him from playing out the fatwa. His admission follows a similar pattern of denunciation by fundamentalist Muslim clerics and mobs who also boasted about not having read the novel when it was published. But this shows that the uproar was not really about the book at all. It was about religious clerics shrewdly seizing upon the opportunity to push a regressive fundamentalist agenda across the world. And in the furor that followed, the media portrayed the matter as a clash between literary writers defending freedom of speech and Muslim hardline clerics and their followers defending freedom of religion. The voices of secular women were nowhere to be heard. But we recognized immediately the warning signs very early on. The fatwa represented an ascendant form of authoritarian politics that threatened women's rights and secular democratic rights. South All Black Sisters set up Women Against Fundamentalism, which consisted of black and white women from all religious backgrounds, to challenge the resurgence of religious fundamentalism worldwide and its implications, particularly for women and for secularism. In a context where the left has largely been silent and was silent at that time, um, and where fundamentalist religious leaders were trying to claim representative status for the communities to which they lay claim, we set about trying to develop an anti-racist, anti-fundamentalist, feminist analysis and response to what was occurring. We made a public statement and organized the now iconic Women Against Fundamentalism protest in Parliament Square. So we were about 40 women challenging the thousands of enraged, mostly young male Muslim demonstrators calling for Rushdie's death. In fear of our own lives, we held up placards and chanted slogans and songs that conveyed our political perspectives. In our eyes, the affair represented a much larger battle between theocrats and Democrats in which feminists have a key stake. 
We argued that fundamentalist forces in every religion, if uncontested, will seek to impose a dogmatic worldview in which the voices of women and sexual minorities will be among the first to be suppressed. Feminism, we said, is in the business of dissenting from the patriarchal order, which in the name of religion and culture justifies violence against women and restricts our right to our minds and our bodies. Ironically, at the same time that we were demonstrating against the anti-Rushdie protesters, the moment also encapsulated our simultaneous struggle against racism because we found ourselves also challenging white racist and fascist youths who were also there and who saw us, the women, as the easier targets upon which to focus their own politics of hatred and exclusion. In the weeks that followed, we found ourselves opposing fundamentalist demands for the extension of blasphemy laws in the UK, which um, um, the uh, Muslim protesters were demanding to protect their religion and all my minority religions from any criticism or dissent. The law, of course, has since been abolished, but at the time, the blasphemy laws only protected um, only afforded protection to the Church of England. And we called instead for the disestablishment of the Church of England, arguing that only a complete separation of religion and the state can guarantee freedom of religion as well as freedom to religion. We oppose fundamentalist demands for funding for religious schools and for the accommodation of religious identity in all aspects of law and policy and in the delivery of welfare services, which we knew was particularly aimed at restricting women's rights and freedoms. All these developments have shown how the suppression of free speech if not effectively opposed, also leads to the violation of other fundamental rights and freedoms. Women Against Fundamentalism has since folded, but in its place, feminist dissent has arisen to continue to build on the political analysis and program that Women Against Fundamentalism laid out. When Rushdie was attacked in summer this year, we put out a statement that reiterated the principles upon which WAF was built. Three decades later in Britain, we can see the consequences of the failure of the left to confront fundamentalism and to confront what it looks like. We have witnessed with alarming frequency attempts by Muslim, Christian, Hindu, Jewish, and Sikh fundamentalists and right-wing forces to clamp down on dissent and to impose a strict religious identity on followers, if necessary, by force and intimidation. Hindu fundamentalists in this country have opposed the introduction of anti-caste discrimination laws and demanded laws to also protect their religion. We have seen a proliferation of religious schools, increasing calls to ban the teaching of sex education in schools, We've seen the spread of a culture of censorship and gender apartheid, and an acceleration in the policing of women's sexuality. We have seen the communalization of social and civic spaces. And actually, if we want to know the logic of that, we only have to look at what happened in Leicester recently, when Hindu and Muslim, mainly men, fought each other on the streets for supremacy. All of this have impacted on women's struggles, but also on progressive anti-racist struggles. And part of the problem is that fundamentalist forces have been clever in dressing up their regressive agenda in the language of anti-racism, anti-discrimination, which has seduced many on the left into believing that they represent the counter-hegemonic struggle against imperialism. Many social movements have actually embraced and given space to religion and religiosity without questioning their values. This is as true of feminism as of other social mobilizations. It is as if the left is simply incapable of examining the, examining the brutality and terrorism promoted by religious fundamentalism in any other way except through the so-called anti-racist lens 
that seeks to embrace, deny, minimize, apologize, or underestimate the threat that it poses. What we are in fact witness to is a new construction of, of a religious-based anti-racism that is centered around the politics of causing offense. It is a poisonous, a progressive, it, sorry, it has poisoned a progressive activism and allowed the state to tiptoe around religion and accommodate regressive demands that wipe out the gains that we have made as feminists. You know, in June in 2018, I was asked uh, by the all-party parliamentary group um, to give evidence on whether to have a working definition um, of Islamophobia. And the chair of the APPG, Baroness Wasi and her allies, were intent on creating such a definition, modeled along the similar lines to the contro controversial International Holocaust Remember Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. I was sandwiched between other witnesses, all of whom approved of having a definition of Islamophobia. But I remain resolute um, and, uh, in my opposition to the idea for a number of reasons. First, I said it's an ambiguous term, which means different things to different people. Two, I said that it would be primarily used to protect Islam from any form of criticism and foster a culture of not just censorship, but also violent censorship. Three, I argued that it would be used to police minority feminists and others that challenge fundamentalist uh, norms. And fourthly, I argue that it would undermine solidarity in the anti-racist struggle because it would create this kind of exceptionalism around um, hatred towards Muslims when in fact what they experience is racism which needs to be located within the wider paradigm of anti-racism. And fifthly, I argued that um, any definition of Islamophobia that suppressed freedom of speech was likely to contravene the uh, Article 10 of the European Convention on Freedom of Expression. But of course, my arguments didn't hold sway and the definition was adopted and it's now been used across the country in, by various state authorities. And just briefly, half a minute, just to say that two things that really trouble me about this was the first thing was that that definition was created by fundamentalists and um, who operate in very left, in very feminist spaces and come across as if they're benign charity organizations and all the while um, they're pushing a particular religious ideology. And the other thing that I worried about was that it would be used, other religions would follow suit. And that's exactly what happened in 2021, in June this year, um, in June of 2021, an early day motion was tabled by Labour MPs and other MPs across the political parties to adopt the term Hindu phobia. Um, and as we know, Hindus have also used the term to ban plays, exhibitions, um, and any kind of dissent from within um, Hindu populations. So I'm going to actually just stop there, but what I do want to say as a final parting shot is that this should all matter to us as feminists, because what we are seeing is the spread of a chilling culture of censorship that seeks to destabilize progressive secular struggles for human rights and democratic accountability. I know that Rinda will be able to talk about this far more expertly in the Indian context. Thank you. Rinda Grover has arrived from India yesterday. Uh, she is a leading lawyer, researcher, and human rights activist based in New Delhi. She has appeared in landmark cases representing victims and survivors of gender-based violence, communal conflict, extrajudicial executions, sexual minorities, human rights defenders, and media practitioners. In 2013, Time magazine listed her as among the 100 most influential people in the world. So. I'm going to build upon what has been said by Rebecca in the definition and the articulation by feminist dissent on the growth of religious fundamentalism in secular constitutional democracies and the description of the Hindu right given by Pragna. 
So I come from the country that popularly likes to call itself the world's largest democracy. In 1947, when India gained independence, it adopted a secular constitutional republic and a constitution which guaranteed not just the right to vote to all, but also changed us from subjects to citizens as we became right holders to multiple freedoms and human rights. Yesterday, the Indian Supreme Court, while hearing a case relating to rampant hate speeches against the Muslim community and complete inaction on part of the state authorities said, and I quote, the complaint which has been raised in the petition is very serious. It relates to the growing climate of hate in the country. This is attributable, according to the petitioner, to an unending flow of what is described as hate speeches being made by various persons against the Muslim community. Then it goes on, and the court says, the Constitution of India envisages Bharat as a secular nation and fraternity assuring the dignity of the individual and unity and integrity of the country. There cannot be fraternity unless members of the community drawn from different religions or castes of the country are able to live in harmony and then it goes on. Why am I referring to this? What are these hate speeches and who is making them? These, and what is the impact that it has on freedom of speech and on participation in particularly political participation by women in the democratic process? These hate speeches are not being made by fringe groups. They are being made by sitting members of parliament and of legislative assemblies belonging to the ruling regime. The ruling government, which is the party that leads it, is the Bharatiya Janta Party, the head of which is Prime Minister Narendra Modi, whose figure and face is well known globally. Bharatiya Janta Party is, finds its ideological source in an organizational network called the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, or the RSS, which is inspired by a fascist ideology, believes in Hindu supremacy. Why I'm articulating this is because I think very often the image of India actually conveys a very different uh, picture than the grim reality we live in today. The Hindutva project, which is being espoused and advocated and mobilized both electorally, uh, ele electorally and now with the Modi government being in power is a political project, the aim of which is to subvert the Indian constitution and all its principles and to convert India into a Hindu Rashtra or a Hindu nation. And that is not a new political project. It has its ideological roots in writings of 1923. And that is where I say there is a fascist inspiration there, as there are historical connects between the fascist movement of Europe and RSS. These speeches that are being delivered are from official Twitter handles in cities across the country where calls are made for Hindus to arm themselves, to boycott the Muslim community, and to arm themselves to be able to defend the Hindu women from the Muslim men who are projected through the narrative and uh, building and myth building of the RSS as invaders who came in, invaded India, raped what is called, seen in Hindu, Hindutva mythology. The country is seen as a deity, as Mother India or Bharat Mata. And therefore the Muslim invaders have raped and partitioned of Indian and formation of India and Pakistan have actually uh, torn apart Mother India. Muslims are therefore seen, particularly Muslim men, as being those who will attack Hindu women and lure them away. So we have across all BJP states today what is called, ironically, Freedom of Religion Act, which actually says that there can be no conversions. And these are anti-conversion laws. Therefore, if a man and a woman from different religions were to marry in those states, 
They would require scrutiny today by the administrative authority of the state, both prior and post the marriage, and therefore the sexual autonomy and agency that women have fought very hard for in India, and a right to choice to marry anyone from across religion, across caste, is being undermined in the name of protecting Hindu women from being lured away by Muslim men. We also have, you know, when I was, uh, we, in the earlier panel, we heard how we know much more about the Iranian women's struggle today because of the internet. How does the internet work? It both provides your platform, but also becomes a space of targeting. On 1st January 2022, we woke up to over 100 Muslim women, all who have a position on the politics of the country, on fundamentalism, on challenging Hindutva, on challenging patriarchy, and are prominent in uh, social media and otherwise, their faces and Twitter handles put on apps which said, bully, buy, and five months prior to that as Sully deals. These are pejorative, abusive terms being used only for targeting outspoken Muslim women with a voice. And on the internet, they are then sexually traded and bartered, and you can actually call out who you would wish to buy and for how much. This kind of sexual targeting, online sexual targeting, has obviously directly impacted these women, many of whom have either abandoned social media or are much more cautious in what they voice. This is, of course, over and above the regular sexual harassment that takes place of particularly Muslim women journalists, but even any other activist who will be challenging the Hindutva project. This challenge takes place not only through this kind of attacks, and there, some of the accused who have been arrested have actually said, and I quote from what the police said, that they have, they believe that these, uh, that the Muslims are the invaders and they are going to destroy Hindu culture and therefore, these are young men. One is an engineering student in one far-flung corner of the country. The other is a university male student in another corner who are making these apps to, uh, to target Muslim women online. We also have today what we like, we call in India the weaponization of criminal law. All those, regardless of whether you're Hindu or Muslim, if you are going to speak out against the Hindutva project, if you are going to stand by victims of massacres of, and targeting of Muslim minority women, then those activists are being penalized, demonized, and criminalized, and actually being sent behind bars for what the court has described as keeping, the, if you have fought for 20 years for justice for a woman, the court described it as an agenda to keep the pot boiling and the activists being sent to jail. So what we are witnessing here is actually a rewriting of history. And because women's actions and women's speech is actually bringing out the facts in different foras, be it in the court, in the media, or on the internet, the facts about how the Hindutva project is going to undermine the secular constitutional gains of Indian democracy, as well as the women's rights gains, whether it is a right to choice of marriage or a right to choice of how we live our lives. All those are being challenged, and therefore women are being suppressed. As, and their voices are being suppressed both through using laws, the legal mechanism, as well as the mob. As Pragna pointed out, it is no longer a simple story. So you will have, under the same regime, the defense minister, the finance minister, and the president of India being women. 
What is it that it conveys to us? And is that the kind of, is that a sign any longer in this century of women's empowerment? And how are we going to be able to uh, understand what are the freedoms that women are seeking? So the story is complex and complicated, and given the geopolitical location of India and the power of India and the market that India provides, we find that there are very, very few solidarities that we are able to create across the globe to be, uh, to be alert to what the Hindutva project is and how this project will, of course, attack women's rights and women's choices, the first and foremost, but will actually spread across. And therefore, when we talk about fundamentalisms, while the fundamentalist regime of Khomeini is known and there are protests and we stand in solidarity with the women of Iran, but we also want attention to what the Hindutva project is about. Love Jihad is the term that has been coined to express what is, uh, uh, is, is the term that has been coined to show how women in particular of the Hindu community are at risk and therefore the militarization of the Hindu community is justified and legitimized. Um, yeah. I'll just stop here to say that we had the most amazing, spectacular, and encouraging democratic rights protests just pre-COVID, where masses of women, particularly Muslim women, came and occupied public streets. Why did they come out on the roads and why did they fight back? Because the government has made a new rule which says that if you are a Hindu Sikh Muslim, a Hindu Sikh Jain or Buddhist from the neighboring countries of Bangladesh, Pakistan or Afghanistan, you will not be deemed to be an illegal migrant if you have entered in 20, before 2014 and if you want citizenship, it will be expedited. India is not the homeland of Hindus. India is a secular, constitutional, democratic republic of all citizens, regardless of religions. Women, particularly Muslim women, fought back against the introduction of faith into citizenship. It is a protest that due to COVID had to be uh, uh, wound up, the leaders of those protests, particularly young men and Muslim, are cutting across religious lines, and a lot of them being feminist young women, are today behind bars because they organized those women, because they gave speeches which alerted uh, the country to what were the fears of going down this route. And today, they are behind bars under most draconian anti-terror laws with no hope of bail. So what we are witnessing today is a struggle to, to hold on to the secular principles on which this democracy was built and leading those struggles are women as they know that they fear, they, they stand to lose perhaps the most in the bargain. Thank you. One of the themes in the amazing panel in the morning was uh, the, that there, everything is global and transnational now. Our resistance is, of course, and we, we try to have feminist solidarity around the world, but unfortunately, um, fundamentalist networks are also global, transnational, and um, working in many different countries. So it's so, um, couldn't be more topical. Our next speaker, Sean Norris, um, will speak about the Christian right and abortion rights. Um, Sean is the Chief European and Social Affairs Reporter at Byline Times. Her book, Bodies Under Siege, How the Far-Right Attack on Reproductive Rights Went Global, will be published in June 23. She specializes in reporting on women's reproductive and sexual rights and men's violence against women and girls. 
Thank you, Sean. Before I get started, I wanted to say, and I wouldn't normally bring up what I'm wearing, but I decided to wear green today in recognition of the incredible green scarf movement in Latin and South America in the fight for abortion rights. Yes. When I was thinking about my answer to this question, I kind of came up with three different pillars to the answer. But before I get to those, I just wanted to talk briefly about the global picture for abortion rights for women and girls. <coughs> Because I believe there is a global war on women and girls, and it is a war of sexual and reproductive entitlement to our bodies that is being run by Christian fundamentalist and nationalist groups, as well as the far right. Across the world, more than 90 million women and girls of reproductive age live in countries where there is no access to legal and safe abortion. In Europe, 20 million people live in countries where abortion is banned, in almost all cases, in countries such as Malta and Poland. And many, many more live in countries where in order to access abortion, they must overcome multiple barriers, from cooling off periods to mandatory counselling, including counselling from priests, or as in Britain, the requirement that two doctors must give consent that continuing the pregnancy will harm a woman's physical and or mental health. And because of this lack of abortion, globally, just under 50,000 women die every year as a result of unsafe abortion. So the right to safe and legal abortion is under threat all over the world. As mentioned in the previous panel, in Poland last January, the Constitutional Court banned terminations in cases of fetal ugh, I can never say this word, anomaly, meaning already restrictive laws became even more draconian. And I think it's really important to recognize that in the year following the ban, at least three women died after being refused life-saving abortion treatment and their names were Isabella, Agnieszka, and Anya. And sadly, more women will die in Poland, and now more women will start to die in the America as well. So I argue in my book and across my reporting that the global assault on women's bodies we are witnessing is linked to a white male supremacist ideology that is forged on the far right and its links to Christian nationalist movements. And that ideology has traveled a pipeline, originating in these far right movements, but then laundered by seemingly respectable anti-abortion organizations, such as Citizen Go, Alliance Defending Freedom, Heartbeat International, Human Life International, the list goes on and on. And then these organizations are funded by US, European, and Russian anti-rights foundations, including at least one donor who has recently been enabled by the Conservative Party. And from there, it becomes pro-natalist government policy across the West. So that's the global picture. In terms of how this relates to free speech, I think there are three different responses to the question. Disinformation, repression and silencing, and weaponization. So the first thing is that I would argue the use of disinformation by Christian nationalist anti-abortion groups is in itself a repression of free speech. And so I'm gonna coin a Steve Bannon phrase, excuse my French, but he says that in order to spread disinformation, we need to flood the zone with shit. And that is what the anti-abortion movement does. It shares disinformation, it shares false, false information, it shares lies and scare tactics in order to inhibit women's access to abortion. Falsely claiming, for example, that abortion leads to death, that it causes breast cancer or infertility, and making false and bizarre claims about contraception that have no basis in fact or reality. And when I went undercover in the Crisis Pregnancy Center movement, I heard some of these pieces of disinformation firsthand. And the most bizarre one was that having an abortion could create sexual dysfunction in your partner, including homosexuality. <laughs> it, was, it was a weird one. And after I reported on that, that video was taken off the internet. <laughs> so further, the use of disinformation is a form of repressing free speech. <laughs> It creates an atmosphere where accurate and supportive information about abortion is seen as untrustworthy. And this is because one of the purposes of disinformation is to make it impossible to have objective truth or fact. So when we see Christian nationalist groups such as Heartbeat International, which operates globally, or organizations in the UK such as Christian Concern and the Christian Medical Fellowship, who spread this disinformation about the impact of abortion on women's health and well-being, what they are trying to do is squeeze the space for pro-abortion advocates to share accurate information that can empower women to have reproductive autonomy over their bodies. So the second way to think about this question is the straightforward repression of free speech. 
And so there are examples of where this is very clear cut in how the Christian nationalist, far right and anti-abortion movements have banned talk about abortion. So on March the 8th this year in Guatemala, the government passed a law that effectively outlawed anyone offering any positive opinion on abortion, which was so draconian, you know, it was actually saying that you couldn't speak support of abortion and reproductive health care. And this was very quickly reversed, and it's kind of, it's not quite sure why it was reversed, but there's some suggestion that the American government intervened. Which is ironic, because now the University of Idaho has done exactly the same thing. It has banned its students and, and staff from being positive about abortion, or what it calls promotion of abortion. And I'm assuming that this will get a legal challenge because of the First Amendment, but it's really chilling that this is now the response to the overruling of Roe, is not only will you not be able to have an abortion, you're not even allowed to talk about abortion. And similarly, across Europe, there are various countries that have bans on publicizing abortion services, what they call abortion propaganda. Although in a good piece of news, this rule was overturned in Germany this year. And I was actually speaking to some activists in Kenya this week who were talking about how anti-abortion groups have been moving into universities and getting them to sign anti-abortion declarations and join chastity societies. And when I was asking about, well, what is the purpose of this? What, why is this happening? The answer, again, was that it squeezes out positive, supportive, and accurate information about abortion and reproductive health care so that women in need of safe abortion cannot access it because the only speech that is allowed or that is platformed is the anti-abortion speech and the disinformation. And the final example is perhaps a kind of inverse of the question, and this is how the Christian nationalist groups who are anti-abortion have weaponized free speech and used it in their armory to attack abortion rights and access to abortion care. And so this is most clear in the UK in the actions of Alliance Defending Freedom or its UK branch, ADF UK. So Alliance Defending Freedom is one of the biggest religious freedom giants in the world. It's based in Arizona. It has a huge, I think it earns about 50 million income a year. And it spends, oh, I'm going to get this right. Well, last year it spent 750,000 pounds in the UK. And interestingly, despite the fact that it's designated as a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center, it was recently quoted approvingly in a Department for Education white paper on freedom of speech. So what it does is it works very closely with university campuses in sort of promoting anti-abortion views. It sort of argues if there's any kind of challenge for anti-abortion protests, that that is an assault on freedom of speech. And they've also been very active on buffer zones, but not so that they succeeded this week because we won that vote, which was great. But they did win in the US. So during a Supreme Court case to try and ban buffer zones um, in Massachusetts, which obviously then went nationwide, um, ADF argued that the buffer zones blocked its client's ability, and I can't believe this sentence, every time I read it, it is bizarre to me. It blocked the ability to leaflet unwilling recipients. It also prevents her from speaking to clients in a normal conversational tone. So what that means is it's like, oh, if you didn't have this buffer zone, we wouldn't have to shout at these women. You're forcing us to shout at them. You're forcing us to push these leaflets into their hands. So it's incredibly victim blaming. And my final point is that what these anti-abortion movements do is that they repress women's free speech to advocate for themselves, to ask for reproductive health care, to ask for an abortion, to recognize their own bodily autonomy. So the idea that they are the pro-free speech advocates and that the pro-abortion movement is anti-free speech is just a horrific act of gaslighting because they are the ones that want to prevent a woman from going, I need an abortion, I want an abortion, and I have a right to abortion. Thank you. Our next speaker you, you know from the, her amazing um, turn on the last panel, Mariam Namazi is an Iranian-born writer and activist living in the UK. She's a spokesperson for One Law for All and the Council of Ex-Muslims in Britain, and um, she will finish the panel here. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to address this issue of free speech and fundamentalism. And again, in this instance, I think we mean all fundamentalisms, Islamic fundamentalism, Hindu fundamentalism, Buddhist fundamentalism, uh, which we see on the rise in Sri Lanka and Myanmar, and of course, Christian fundamentalism. And I think 
when you look at the issue of fundamentalism and freedom of speech, I think the very act of a woman speaking is in reality an act of blasphemy. It is an act of apostasy. And I think that the reality is that under religious rules, and in my context I'm talking about Islamic rules, but I think it applies across the board, depending on how much power they have. They're a lot nicer and a lot more cuddly when they don't have power. Then they're handing out soup and helping the homeless. But of course, you still have to come to church and listen to their nonsense. Um, they, you know, so depending on the level of power they have, uh, it is truly a crime to be a woman. You know? And if you look at Sharia law, not just in Iran or Afghanistan or Saudi Arabia, but also in Sharia courts here in Britain, Pragna and I have been working on the One Law for All campaign for many years now, as has South Hall Black Sisters. You know, the, the, a, anything that is to the benefit of women, they are against. And anything that hurts women is their logo and their dogma and their text. Uh, I mean, you can, you can it, it, it is exactly that way. So under Islamic rules, for example, um, a woman's right to divorce is limited. A woman uh, can't have child custody at, after a preset age. But stoning a woman is all right. The only problem is the size of the stone. Uh, it's okay to have child marriages. It's okay to have several wives. Uh, domestic violence is the prerogative of the husband. You know, it's, it's a topsy-turvy world. And that's why secularism is not just a philosophical idea, but it is a matter of life and death for many women, particularly those who live under the boot of the religious right. They, you know, when we speak, it's often considered a provocation. You're provoking them, that's why they want to kill you. You're provoking them, that's why, you know, they, uh, they have to silence you and cover you up and erase you from the public space. I'm sorry, but they're provoking us. They're provoking me. And our, our speaking up with the only tools we have, you know, our, our hands and our voices and our bodies, that is the only way we are able to challenge them and challenge them we will. I wanted to just use uh, a few minutes to show you a couple of things that we've done at the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain and One Law for All. You know how in Iran they have the Commission for the Promotion of Virtue and the Prevention of Vice at one of the uh, gay prides that we were at. We were actually the imams of sin and anything that's haram and, uh, you know, uh, sinful. And we were actually there to promote vice and prevent virtue. Um, so using comedy and, um, you know, uh, mockery in order to challenge these rules. This is Muhammad himself, the prophet, who is here at Gay Pride. If Jesus can be there, Muhammad can certainly be at Gay Pride as well. <laughs> Allah is a woman. You know, I don't believe in Allah, of course. Uh, but this is, again, uh, not saying that Allah is nice. He definitely isn't. Uh, but it's saying that acts of blasphemy is what we as women do. So Allah is a woman. Actually, we, we, I held this sign at a protest in Germany in defense of two women lesbians on death row in Iran and um, young Muslim men passing by and some women started shouting Allahu Akbar. And I said, I'm sorry that you are more offended by this sign than the fact that two lesbian women are facing execution in Iran. Allah is a lesbian. The woman's Quran, now we have created the woman's Quran and you ask what's in it, well it's actually blank because there's nothing good in the Quran for women. And this is, uh, and since the woman's Quran is blank, we've been making our own uh, verses in the Quran. Now this one, uh, it's, it's not in, far, uh, in English, but you know the surah in the Quran which says that women are your tilth, go and tilth and, and use them in any way we want, you want. Uh, this surah says, uh, why don't you go and um, tilt some donkey feed for yourself so that you have something to feed yourself with. Uh, the next one, 
is again saying, oh, you believing men, if you can't see women's hair, well, we found a solution for you. Uh, this is at a recent protest in uh, London, uh, burning uh, the veil and also burning the bra. So maybe feminists can see the link there. Uh, and of course, topless protests. I'm not sure. I, th I think there are feminists who don't agree with uh, nude protest and topless protest. But I think given the fact that you're dealing with a religious right movement that wants to erase you in every way, fabric, you know, with fabric on your body, your voice is banned. In that sense, I think, uh, when a woman's body has been used as a tool of suppression, not just of women, but of society at large, then woman's bodies in her own hand as political protest is an important tool for liberation. Uh, the first one was in front of a major mosque in Köln, uh, which was going to say the azan or the call to prayer for the first time. Yes, you have a right to your religion, but don't bring it in my public space. Because that azan reminds me of all the women raped and tortured and executed, because that's what they used in Iran to do that. And this is at the Louvre in 2014. Our bodies are our weapons against the religious right. This is uh, uh, drinking and eating during Ramadan. Uh, I have, uh, you know, the prayer beads and also the Iranian regime's flag has Allah in the center, which has been cut out. And actually in the previous photo, I had put something much more useful and valid in its place. Next, this is uh, work we do on women leaving Islam. Ex-Muslim because. Some people don't believe in flying horses. Get over it. Ex-Muslim because no 72 virgins for me. <laughs> and again, this is all about, you know, the fundamentalists don't represent us. They don't speak for us. We will not be silenced. We will not live our lives according to their choices. We will provoke. We will mock. And we will defend women life freedom. Thank you.